So there's an entire area, a field of economics, that looks how the behaviors of one party impact the behaviors of another and how we can make decisions when our decisions impact others' decisions and their decisions impact ours. This is game theory. So we want to take a look at how game theory works. And one of the most popular examples of game theory uses Boris and Natasha. And so Boris and Natasha, if you can remember, are characters in Bullwinkle. So Boris and Natasha are bank robbers. And in this prisoner's dilemma, Boris and Natasha have been arrested. And since we've all seen uh, movies and TV shows where they arrest suspects, what do they do? Well, they put them all in separate rooms, right? And the idea is, is that we tell each of them that if they're the first to confess, they'll get a deal. And so we're using these incentives to change people's behavior. So let's look at how the game theory works. And what we have here is a payoff matrix. This payoff matrix shows the decisions that Boris and Natasha have to make and the outcomes that they receive or the payoffs they get based on their decisions. So they're each gonna make decisions separately because remember they're in separate rooms, but there is going to be a ultimate outcome and that outcome that we'll find is the outcome where there's no incentive to change. So economics spends a lot of time looking at equilibriums. We do it on supply and demand graphs. We'll look at it here. Equilibrium simply means there's no incentive to move, to change your position. In this case, we're going to look for what's called a Nash equilibrium. And the Nash equilibrium, okay, so perhaps you've seen this movie, A Beautiful Mind, starring Russell Crowe, is about a guy named John Nash. And he's the one, not Russell Crowe, but the original John Nash came up with the Nash equilibrium by looking at game theory. So let's walk through this. All right, you're Boris. You have to decide, should you confess or not confess? Well, if you assume that Natasha confesses, then Boris has a choice. He can also confess and he will get five years. Or he cannot confess. Essentially, Natasha will blame it all on him and he'll get 10 years. So what's the better option for Boris? If not Natasha confesses, Boris is better off having also confessed. Well, what if instead, because remember Boris is in a separate room, what if instead Natasha does not confess? If Natasha says nothing, and Boris confesses, right, he gets the deal, he talked first, and he will get to go free. Let me just move my face here, if I can. Move myself up here. Okay, so if Natasha says nothing, and Boris does not confess, so both of them say nothing. There's still some circumstantial evidence and they'll get two years. Okay, less a lesser punishment because we don't have the full story. So what's better for Boris? To confess and go free or to not confess? Well, he's better off, right, to go free. So given this scenario, what's the best option for Boris is for him to confess. Remember, Natasha's in a separate room, so she has to make a similar decision. She doesn't know what Boris is going to do. If Boris confesses, then Natasha has to decide whether she's going to confess and get five years or not confess. In this case, Boris essentially talks first and blames it all on her and she gets 10 years. So what's the better choice for Natasha? It is for her to confess. What if Boris does not confess? If Boris says nothing, Natasha can choose to confess, in which case she will go free, right? She talked first, she blamed it all on him. Or if Boris says nothing, she could instead say nothing as well, circumstantial evidence, they both get two years. What's better for Natasha? Well, it's better for her to be the first one to speak and then she would go free. So notice in this situation, the Nash equilibrium
is that they both confess. And it's because we've actually structured this payoff matrix to create an incentive for them both to confess. And, and that's what you see on crime shows, right? You separate them, you tell them whoever talks first gets the best deal. This creates an incentive for everyone to confess. We've actually changed the cost benefit analysis for both Natasha and Boris to get them to behave a certain way. Now, is this the optimal outcome? If you're Natasha or Boris, it's not. You'd much rather have, you know, collectively the best outcome is two years for each. Individually, the best outcome would be to go free. The Nash equilibrium is where there's no incentive to change. And that's because in this case, we look at what is best for Natasha given what Boris might do, what's best for Boris given what Natasha might do. And we end up here. We've structured it to elicit a certain behavior. So in our discussion right now, we're looking at how we act in our own self-interest. We weigh the costs and benefits. We are rational. We do things when the extra benefit is more than the extra cost. And we respond to incentives. Those, change, those extra benefits and extra costs can change to change your behavior. Later this semester, we will look at oligopolies. This is where you have a market with a small handful of companies and their decisions, their strategic decisions as companies impact each other. And therefore they're using game theory to make strategic decisions on uh, new products, on um, promotional materials, recognizing that their behavior impacts the other company and the other company's behavior impacts them. So we're gonna dig more into game theory later this semester. One last thing before we leave this topic is the application of game theory in history. So during the Cold War, so Cold War, US and Russia, both developing nuclear weapons, and there's a concern that nuclear war is going to break out worldwide. Okay, so under President Kennedy, there was a meeting at Camp David, and this is the presidential retreat in the U.S., and they got together and they were doing war games. So this is basically talking through strategy. If Russia does this, then what happens? And if we do this, then what does Russia do? and walking through all these different scenarios. And, and as they were doing these war games, what they came across is everything led to nuclear war, mutual annihilation. So for example, a Russian soldier sees an American across the border, gets spooked, scares them. The US responds to the shooting of their soldier by firing back. One group fires at another, it escalates until there's nuclear war. And the same thing on the other side, right? One, the U.S. could misinterpret something the Russians did, the Russians could misinterpret something that the Americans did. And in fact, this has been a problem recently in Syria. We have Russia and the U.S. both uh, being parties to the conflict in Syria, and we had a U.S bomb a, um, an airport where Russian soldiers were at. Russian soldiers have taken over uh, bases where Americans were. You know, are these acts of aggression, is this really a war between Russia and the US? Well, during Kennedy and these war games, the problem was is that every little thing escalated until you had mutual annihilation, both parties just bombing each other. Well, Thomas Schelling, an economist from Harvard, he heard about these war games and he called up the president and said, you know, I have a solution, right? Using game theory, we can actually predict what will happen and we can create an out. So we can create an incentive structure that this tit for tat doesn't escalate into mutual annihilation. And what was created was the Moscow-Washington hotline. It's the red phone. So if you've seen movies, there's often reference to a red phone uh, if it's about the Cold War. It's not a real phone. Uh, there's not physically a red phone in the president's office, but it is a hotline, a way to quickly call between Russia and Canada, er, Russia and the US uh, to help um, stop the escalation, to say, hey, 
Did you really mean to start a conflict? Um, you know, was that an accident? Uh, are you really trying to escalate this? And so that can kind of dampen um, the heat, the pressure, and prevent it from escalating. And we've actually seen a revival of this Cold War style hotline um, as there are increased tensions between the East and the West when we look at Ukraine, when we look at Syria, and I have a link to an article in Blackboard related to that. Okay, so we're going to spend some more time on game theory later this semester, but right now we just want to look at how people make decisions and how those decisions can be changed with incentives.